Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. My name is James Basnett and I'm the head of strategy and retail at Shape Immersive. Um, we've got a really uh, amazing panel for you today. And this is uh, one of a series called Shape the Future in which we try to bring experts from AR and VR together with leaders in retail so that we can understand what are the impacts on things like 3D commerce on web AR and how these retail organizations are going to push their brands forward. Uh, this is the third of our series, and we've got representatives today from Ventana, Shopify, from Endeavor VR, as well as 8th Wall. So really excited to dig into the, the bottom of the funnel. So today's session is called um, Shopping in the Digital World, How AR is Doubling E-Commerce Conversion Rates. And it gives us an opportunity to really start looking at 3D assets and how they're impacting consumers, whether they're on the desktop web or on their mobile phones. They're able to now see 3D assets in, in their hand as well as in their space. And so this is changing the way that e-commerce is going to function. And we're really in the first inning of using this technology, but there's unbelievable impacts that we're seeing across the board right now. The event today was organized by Dan Berger and Alice Chuang, who have done an incredible job of shepherding the augmented reality and virtual reality communities for the past five years. They've really come together to build Vancouver into a top two VR AR hub, and uh, we're really lucky to have them pull us all together for the session today. The Shape the Future series is supported by Accenture Interactive, one of our sponsors, Shape Immersive, as well as the Vancouver VR AR Association. Shape Immersive is an innovation agency. We have partners um, in, in the brand world, in the solution world, and in the CGI world uh, across the planet. And really focus on building experiences as well as e-commerce solutions that are helping lift some of those core retail metrics today. The Vancouver VR AR Association is a connected group of over 250 companies that's focused on building Vancouver as a hub for the technology, as well as helping support and scale the membership companies. So when we look at retail today, there's a lot of interesting things that have come out this week. We see some data from April where there is a 12% increase in first time e-commerce buyers, which is wild. You know, we've never really seen more than a percent in a month and here we're seeing 12 in one month. And so that's introducing a whole new group of people to buying on their phone and, and buying online. Uh, we see things that are happening in brick and mortar retail with Simon Property Group just pulled out of uh, acquiring another large portfolio of malls. And, and we're seeing this really exodus from some of our brick and mortar spaces and in our mall, mall portfolios. Um, and something really interesting that we just, we just caught from AR Insider today that um, there is a a new campaign that's been run around vacuums um, that saw a 32% increase in click-through rates, 23% lower cost per click, and an overall cost per acquisition that was 74% less than non-AR benchmarks. So we're starting to see that you know the top of the funnel were being impacted by a lot of interesting AR um, technology. And now it, you know we're going to be able to discuss you know the bottom of the funnel, how we're getting people through that process, and how AR is changing the game. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, our, our vibrant moderator for today, Amy Peck, who is the founder of Endeavor VR. Amy, if you'll take it away, please. Great. Thank you so much, James. Well, we have uh, another fantastic panel. And yeah, I think, you know, we, we all understand the engagement metrics, but engagement is meaningless without conversion. So we really want to, to have... Uh, a, a much sort of deeper dive and look at some of the um, behaviors that um, we're seeing with consumers and how we can drive um, this level of interaction all the way through to sale. Uh, so we've got Daniel Beecham from Shopify. We have Tom Emmerich from Eighth Wall and our very special surprise guest today, <laughs> Ashley Crowder from Ventana. So I'm going to let uh, Daniel start and give us a little bit more of an introduction, and he has uh, a short video uh, to share as well. Daniel. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, really excited to be here. So I'm Daniel Bosha. I head up the ARVR team at Shopify. 
Our Shopify is a commerce platform that powers over a million uh, brands and merchants across the world. And it's my team's job to figure out you know, how can we get those merchants ready for this spatial computing future that's coming. And it's about democratizing the technology so that even if you're just you know, starting off a small t-shirt business in your basement, you still have access to the same you know, AR and VR technology that the, the big players have access to. Uh, when people think about um, AR and AR offerings, like our most recent AR offering is being able to place products in your space uh, and, and preview them in AR. A lot of people think furniture, uh, being able to place a sofa or an end table, but we're actually seeing adoption from a wide array of verticals on our platform. So James, if you could kick off that video. Um, here's a little video of just some of the uh, products being shown um, on our platform. So here is a, a beautiful speaker that you could see on your, let's say, table, see what that looks like. Not only see the size, but get up close and see the, the details. You know, we have uh, electronics, like the Instant Pot, and what does this thing look like on you know, my kitchen uh, counter? Now you can see it. Dog beds is a big one. I had no idea until I got a dog recently just how many sizes <laughs> there are of dog beds. Um, and then you also have you know, sporting goods, so, so this bicycle. And what I love about this, like I said, is it's not just about seeing the size, it's getting up close, it's seeing the details in a really intuitive way. Like with this bag, I can get up close, I can see the details in the leather, uh, I can see the stitching, I can get so much more information than I could get from a regular product photo. And then this is my favorite here. So this is a merchant of ours that sells a replica of Jerry Seinfeld's apartment. So this miniaturized replica. <laughs> and you, it's just such an amazing product and to be able to view it in AR is just awesome. So that was just a, a quick sort of compilation of some of the different verticals we're seeing uh, leverage AR on our platform. Great. Thanks so much, Daniel. And I, I, I've met you a hundred times and I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. It's just sad. <laughs> that was my fault. Um, no Tom, Tom Emmerich from Eighth Wall. Nice Hi. To you, Tom. Nice to see everybody, and thanks to uh, Dan and, and Alex for having me. Really excited to be talking about the massive opportunity that is AR and retail. And, and Daniel, I can't wait to see like the sign called Big Salad in your, in your video coming up. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about 8Ball. At 8Ball, we're on a mission to make reality content for everyone. And we're doing this by equipping developers, brands, and agencies with the tools they need to develop augmented reality and virtual reality for the web or what's known as web AR and web VR. Our AR engine enables world tracking augmented reality, so placing augmented reality in the world in front of you, image target augmented reality, which is augmented reality that's triggered from, let's say, a book cover or a magazine page or signage. And recently, we debuted our face effects, which now allows for our developers to develop augmented reality for the face on the web, which means that they can anchor 3D objects on their face or around their face, such as you know, virtual jewelry, virtual uh, accessories like sunglasses, as well as instantly render a mesh uh, and apply a design uh, to create like a face a uh, mask or a face paint or face tattoo uh, like experience. Um, we have our own uh, Eighth Wall Cloud Editor, which is our cloud-based web development platform. Uh, this was really built from the ground up for reality content development for the web. Uh, it comes equipped with a fully featured code editor, uh, project templates, a sample project library to help you get up and started uh, very quickly. You can invite unlimited team members from around the globe, which um, is essential during these times especially, and they can all collaborate on the same project, uh, and that's all managed with our integrated distributed source control, and that all comes with built-in hosting. So just one click of a button to make your project live to the world with over 200 points of presence around the globe. Uh, what's really cool about web AR, and I, I kind of want to stress this, is that um, in web development, uh, the developers are, are really getting complete control over the, their web AR and web VR experience. And so this means that they can uh, uh, control where this web AR uh, experience will live, whether that be a separate destination or inline and alongside the main site using inline AR. They can control uh, you know, the, the, the asset types, the asset sizes, the launch timing, the update schedule, uh, the content guidelines they feel will maximize the value for their audience, as well as any external libraries that they want to use, like their own preferred analytics system or CRM system or payment system. 
Uh, and uh, of course, this is all frictionless, no app required. Just click a link or scan a QR code. Uh, and it's cross-platform. In fact, our FaceFX works on desktop and smartphones and tablets. Um, and we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, brands, um, agencies, and organizations leverage uh, web AR uh, in particular to meet real goals uh, for their business. Uh, and I think we have a video, James, which you can queue up to see some of the examples that 8th Wall has powered via our agency partners. So what you're seeing here are a couple of examples uh, that are all powered by 8th Wall. Again, there's no app required. There might be a little bit of a lag on Zoom, so uh, rest assured there's no lag in real time. Uh, but these are uh, examples showing how web AR is being used across various verticals. Uh, we saw you know, toys, retail, fashion here with Coach via Catalyst VR. Uh, we've also um, seen uh, journalism and news organizations leverage web AR, uh, as well as sports and entertainment, uh, automotive. And so it really spans the gamut of uh, across industry vertical in the use of this technology. And here, just a sneak peek, I'm really hitting home the fact that 8 Wall is the tools that have powered uh, these uh, experiences. And uh, this is uh, some screenshots here from uh, our cloud editor, which you can log in and, and start developing your web AR experience straight away. Thanks, James. I appreciate that. That looks great. And Ashley Crowder from Ventana, welcome. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, tell us a little bit about you and uh, Ventana. Yeah, it's so great to be here. A little last minute, so <laughs> appreciate it. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ventana, and we make it easy to take existing manufacturing design files and immediately create 3D web and AR experiences. Um, we're actually, we actually work with both Shopify and 8th Wall. Uh, so we, we're really here to help solve the, the 3D asset problem. And so um, I, I've got a video I can share. Um, quickly. Uh, there's no audio as I talk. So there's just a, a few different examples. Um, and, and as, uh, you know, other panelists were mentioning, it's, it's not just shoes and furniture. It's, it's also clothing and, and tents. Um, and, you know, if you're a retailer, you might design in Clo, Optitex, or Browseware. Um, or it's more industrial, it's AutoCAD SolidWorks. Whatever it is, we, we saw a lot of companies having to just rebuild these from scratch, hiring agencies, because those files were way too big and not in the right formats. Um, and so what our software does is it actually takes that, automatically optimizes it, converts it, um, and gives you what you need for not only web, but also to take advantage of all the amazing advertising platforms out there today, like Unity and Google and Snap that all require, have their own 3D file format requirements. So instead of your team having to recreate the same shoe 10 different ways, uh, our software just automatically processes it and gives you what you need for all those platforms. That's great. Well, thanks so much for those introductions. And I'm Amy Peck. I'm the founder and CEO of Endeavor VR. And we work with a number of different enterprises um, just looking at you know, scaling XR uh, across multiple business units in, in any company. Um, so let's kind of dive right in. Uh, since we are doing a deeper dive here, let's you know, talk about some numbers. I know, Daniel, you have a lot of numbers. I just think all of you do. Um, on, on really what we're seeing in terms of, you know, engagement through to conversion, but, but what are some of the metrics that we're seeing that actually get us to that conversion state? Yeah, so we were, you know, we were actually quite surprised by just how well AR has been working for our merchants. Um, we've been doing a lot of tests over the past year and a half, but we've had AR support on Shopify. We've seen that, um, buyers who uh, use AR are up to two and a half times more likely to convert than those who don't. Now, I, I do want to stress there, it is up to two and a half times percent. I don't want to, uh, two and a half times. I don't want to say that you know, anyone who uses it will get like astronomical returns on <laughs> conversions, but we are seeing that on average, we're, we're, it, it is a boost in conversion. Um, with our, our most recent launch, which was true native support of 3D on Shopify, so you can just drag and drop 3D models right onto your uh, product page in the same way that you can drag photos and videos. Um, Rebecca Minkoff uh, did a, a test 
of, I'd say, 30 or so uh, models uh, of new handbags. And that brand saw, I think it was 65% um, people who, who used AR were 65% more likely to add to cart and 62% more likely to actually complete the order. Uh, so once again, we're talking about getting more confidence when you're shopping online. It's not only seeing the size of it, because that's a big one. It's, hey, how big is this thing? But it's also being able to see it from any angle you want. I mean, you probably all have the experience of going to an online store and seeing some product and going like, well, well wait a minute, what does it look like from the back? Or what does it look like from the bottom? And there's just no product photo for it. And traditionally, you'd go to maybe a store to go check it out. But during you know these most recent COVID times, you, you can't. So the ability to just take that 3D model and say, oh, I'll just rotate it and see what it looks like underneath, or I'll, I'll zoom inside of it, or I'll look at it from any angle I want, it increases um, confidence, and therefore, it's kind of a no-brainer why it's increasing conversions. Yeah. And Tom, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I would just to add to that physicality. I mean, I know that there's this term going around that's not relatively new called fidgetal, which makes some people feel uncomfortable just saying it. But I love it because it's like the digitization of the physical and the, the physicality of the digital. And I think that's really uh, one of these huge elements when it comes to e-commerce is making the online shopping experience feel more physical. Uh, and uh, and I think like I think what's really um, magical about AR and VR is that uh, these are experienced uh, mediums. These are living mediums. They're, it's a much different medium than the more passive mediums on the 2D web, like video or photo, GIFs and text. And so uh, what this presents is an opportunity for us to really look at a new series of metrics um, that you know, organizations need to focus on when it comes to augmented reality in particular. And, and what we can, where we can glean insight is how we describe our own everyday experiences as uh, people living in the real world. And, uh, and so how do you describe an experience? You, drive, you describe an experience about how much time you spent there, you describe an experience about like what you did and what you interacted with, what you saw, what you remember, and how you felt. That's how you describe an experience. And, and so um, focusing your web AR or augmented reality experiences around metrics on dwell time, on engagement, on recall, on sentiment, um, these are uh, the metrics that are going to lead up to the conversion point that, that Daniel was talking about. Um, you know, an AR insider you know, had a, a great stat out on uh, dwell time with web AR indicating that for 50% of users, you know, uh, they saw uh, two minutes or greater uh, spending time within that web AR experience. Um, you know, when we look at when we look at the opportunity to not just place a 3D object in the space, but to interact with it, to change the color of the purse or the, change the body of the purse and the handle of the purse or, you know, mix a virtual cocktail um, or, you know, uh, you know bring, a, bring a packaging to life by making the back of a cereal box an interactive game, you're, you're significantly increasing the dwell time, whether it be with a physical product and packaging or whether it be with a digital you know, good. And that starts to form a very powerful relationship. Um, uh, and also, as Daniel mentioned, bolster confidence um, in a very vulnerable part of the, uh, the purchasing funnel. Uh, so those are some of the, the, the key uh, things that I, I'd advise anybody in the retail or other, you know, industry sectors to, to take a look at. And Ashley, so you've had, uh, I mean, you're sort of working with all, you know, all manner of 3D objects. We saw, you know, one that could have been used for training and a mechanic, you know, for mechanics. Um, but on the retail side specifically, you know, what are you seeing and, and do, you, are you, are, do you have visibility into these metrics and how well um, these digital objects are performing versus traditional 2D imagery? Yeah, I mean, just echoing what everyone else said, but what, what we find interesting, especially with our apparel clients, is they're not just using this for consumer-facing sites, but they're actually creating digital showrooms for buyers. Um, so obviously with COVID, you know, it stopped all sales travel, uh, you know, it prevented getting prototypes into the hands of, of those potential buyers. So it's, it's not only lifting that consumer purchase, um, but it's also lifting that buyer. Like if, if you are a brand and you go to Nordstrom and say, well, you can check this out in 3D and you're comparing that to a competitor who just has a 2D photo, I understand what this garment looks like that much better. And, and I'm more confident I can, I can make that purchase. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's a hundred percent. And then on the advertising front, um, you know, we're seeing that people are 
engage, like 50% of people are, are actually engaging with a 3D ad, uh, which is huge. Not, like it's, it's usually in the ones and twos percent of people who engage with a, a pop-up ad, right? Um, so, so that is massive. And then we're, we're now getting to the point where we can track that click and if that purchase was made, you know, be with great integrations with Shopify and SAP Commerce Cloud, so we can kind of track that data along the entire uh, funnel, which is exciting. That's great. And so uh, let's go to a couple of questions from our audience. The first one I saw pass by a, a few minutes ago. Um, so, you know, we've seen things like handbags and shoes and, you know, Daniel mentioned furniture um, and clothing. Are there some other product lines that maybe people haven't really thought of or that just don't come top of mind where maybe you've seen um, some interesting use cases, again, driving more, you know, driving towards sales? Anyone just hop in. Everything at Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like if I could, like I think my mother's redone the kitchen three times. If she could have just seen what those kitchen knobs look like, do you know what I mean? Or you know, I, I do lots of home projects, and if if I could just see what the back of that bracket looked like, and I would know if that would fit better. Um, so so any type of home projects, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, all those parts are, I think, mm -hmm. huge impact. And yeah. it's not just it's not and it's not just about product visualization as well. Like what we're also seeing is, um, and one of the things I love is like turning a product into like a salesperson by by telling more of the story, right? And so uh, Nike did a really great campaign with uh, Unit Nine, which used the top of a Nike shoe box to help use animations, 3D animations uh, in augmented reality to further illustrate their commitment to sustainability, which is a core tenant as part of that product. And so, you know, it, uh, I think like the product visualization, the virtual try-on are extremely powerful uh, components when it comes to the use of augmented reality for retail, but thinking about how you can allow for augmented reality to tell more of the story, to give more information, to give context, to help, you know, personalize and customize that product to help the user more, much better visualize how it can enhance their life and bring a smile and joy to their world. Um, these are all things that augmented reality can, can achieve today. The configurability aspect is a huge one. Like I remember speaking to this uh, one owner of like a, a road bike store in Toronto and they say that they sell these like $10,000 like awesome racing bicycles but and you can cu customize everything like down to like the little like knob that you put in to like put in the air in your tires like colors of everything but obviously in their store they don't have enough space mm. to have all those configurations. But if you could just walk into that store and be handed like a tablet where you just like pick your colors and everything and in front of you, you see that bike, the exact bike you're about to, to purchase as it will look in real life. And you can maybe even go out to your car and say, oh, what will it look like strapped, you know, the top of my car. Um, that's powerful. And yeah. that's not only, not only beneficial to the customer, it's that merchant, it's, they, they might not need to have this huge warehouse anymore. Now they could have a, a smaller footprint, but still be able to show every single product combination they offer. That's great. So we have another question, which is actually very interesting. So um, what do you think about AR experiences that are, are already digital? So like music, exclusive content experiences, and you know, where do you see AR, VR, um, you know, being able to move people more towards purchase? I mean, is anyone buying music anymore? I mean, I think we're all streaming, but I don't know. Uh, well, I think like uh, I, I, I have an example within the entertainment industry, which is more movie ticket related. Uh, so, you know, Trigger, uh, the mixed reality agency teamed up with uh, Sony Pictures for Jumanji, the next level. Uh, which allowed for tabletop experiences of scenes from Jumanji. So being able to place like the desert and you know run with the ostriches. And so uh, I think like uh, earlier before uh, the, the panel began to broadcast, James and I were talking about like the psychology of shopping. And I think like getting people into that zone, into that mindset, getting them excited, getting them acclimated and um, and entrenched in that storytelling that is part of your product marketing is so key to leading them down that funnel to purchase. And so within this, this voice activated experience where you told the map where to go, very Jumanji-like, 
um, you know, you're, you're seeing behind the scenes footage, you're experiencing 3D uh, scenes, again, um, you know, right before your very eyes, and it's all geared towards leading you towards uh, clicking that purchase of buying the movie ticket so you can, you know, experience the other side of Jumanji, which is the big motion picture. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? I think I've, you know, with music, you know, obviously what Travis Scott just did with, with yeah. Fortnite was incredible. Um, and I think it's opening up the, the music industry's eyes of, of what you can really do. Um, you know, I've seen instead of a QR code, you can use sound waves to send a link to someone. So imagine, mm -hmm. you know, if a, if a song opened up your phone and sent you to a link that then had amazing, you know, AR visuals flying around your home as you listen to this mm -hmm. music, that would be incredible. I, I might pay additional for, for that. <laughs> that. That could be that, you know, the future album is, is not list buying the music, it's buying this experience, you know, which can be amazing. I think that's right. I think, and then even within these, you know, exclusive experiences, there are even more opportunities for there to be kind of organic interaction with products and brands. And so I think yeah. it, it kind of flows in and out. Um, so there's, um, a question about uh, brands who don't actually do their own product imagery and they're reliant on brands and sellers to provide their own imagery. So is it possible to recreate assets to 3D? Now you can do it from 2D, it's suboptimal. Generally there's a 3D, if it's been designed, it, there's a 3D uh, file of it somewhere, but if you don't have access to it, um, what are some of the, the best options to be able to bring these products into 3D? Uh, photogrammetry and, and scanning has, has come a long way. Uh, we're working with a number of great scanning companies. Third is one um, in Europe. Uh, Simulated Ventures is one in LA. Um, and and you know if th there is a cost to shipping the product and getting it there, and sometimes you know there there is limitations on it's not great with transparency for glasses. But if your shoes, if your purses, that that's a really great option. Um, and, and something we're trying to do is, is solve that drop ship problem. So, you know, if you are a brand using our software, you know, we can help give Nordstrom's or give Macy's the, you know, if you're doing 3D and here's the, the drop ship version. So it looks the exact same because Macy's doesn't want one brand to look different from the other, but here's that standard 3D mm -hmm. commerce. That's great. And, and yeah. Daniel, have you seen some of that? Well, so, so the, that's like our, our number one challenge is how do we get our merchants, you know, digitize 3D assets of all their products. Um, you know, some do have the budgets to do like photogrammetry and, you know, set up big scanning rigs or stuff like that. But for a lot of our merchants, they just want the simplest, you know, cheapest, quickest mm -hmm. thing possible. And so what we've offered is... Um, Right within Shopify, you can request a 3D model to be made of any of your products. You then have to just upload a few photos of it. So let's say you're modeling um, a sofa, a photo from the front, from the side, from the top. Chances are you already have those photos as product photography and some measurements. And that gets sent off to one of our trusted 3D partners. So we have a partner network with these awesome companies who specialize in creating beautiful 3D uh, models from reference photography. So to name a few, we have CG Trader on there, Saduk, uh, Space is on there too. And they're just these fantastic companies where from those photos, you know, in a, a one to two week turnaround time, they will get you back a beautiful 3D model of your product that will have uh, not just the dimensions, but also the materials will just look so perfect. And like they'll, they'll be able to get glass right and they'll be able to get all the details of like scratches and leather and stuff like that. And the the cost is actually surprisingly quite low. So it does r depend on the complexity of the product. If you were to do something like a, a small table lamp or like a small vase, that might be you know, 50 to $100 to, to create. And then it will go up based on complexity. So if you're doing a bicycle or if you're doing a stroller, that might be three, $400 because of the increased complexity. But you could totally justify that based on those conversion rates, right? If you go, well, wait a minute, my stroller that I'm selling for $800, uh, if I can, you know, two X my conversion rate by getting one three D model made, that's worth it. So that's kind of how we're we do need to sort of position it to be like look at the ROI here and look at all the different ways that that three D model can then be used. It's not just about putting on your site; it's about 
putting it in an ad, putting it in an eighth wall, uh, you know, web experience, uh, doing product photography. I mean, Ikea catalogs are like 90% CGI. So being able to use those assets in all these different areas, that just kind of strengthens the, uh, the case for why uh, merchants should, should get 3D. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. And we're going to start to see again, these 3D objects, uh, you know, kind of organically in ex uh, other experiences, you know, that, that are just out there, you know, like maybe launched by, by a piece of music as Ashley suggested. Uh, so we have another question here around virtual stores. The in-store experience is heavily curated as AR VR storefronts get sophisticated, imagining shopper interaction, user-generated content, et cetera. How will they handle grief, trolling, harassment? Are we, the, are we talking about environments that are open? Is the question around like bringing a store to the home, like a portal, or is it about going it to like- It sounds like it's sort of a public, like it's a public experience, because otherwise how would other people be able to kind of get in and, and, you know, ruin the experience for others? I mean, that's part of the social contract, which is a bigger discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but let's maybe sort of very quickly talk about that, um, because it is a concern. But I think I would, I don't want to steer us too far off the, the road here. Well, the, the majority of um, empty spaces that I've seen be turned into air activated stores are in complete control of the brand and using QR codes um, or, you know, leveraging either like an application like uh, Instagram or Snap or, you know, again, using QR codes that, that link to the, the web browser. So um, I think I think where we may want to have a discussion um, and I, I agree with you, Amy, I think this is a whole other panel is like when we start talking more about like the use of AR cloud and persistency and and as the, the, the question asker uh, pointed out, uh, more of that user generated content where I go into a store and I start, you know, for lack of better words, using AR graffiti on like you know, the, the, uh, the toy store or the apparel store that I'm in. Um, and, and I agree with you. I think there's like a new social contract uh, that needs to be put in place in order for us to, you know, uh, abide by perhaps similar rules um, that we do um, in the real world where you don't walk into, you know, your nearest Nike store with like a spray paint can. <laughs> uh, you just don't do that today. So probably you shouldn't do that in AR, but I think there will be opportunities, um, of course, especially because you can just like push a button and delete everything, you know, hey, for, you know, retail to start to use these collaborative multi uh, user experiences to engage their user in store and even use that as an opportunity to drive folks to store. What I love about augmented reality is it has the ability to wipe the need for um, a, a geolocated um, location completely by bringing a store, for example, to your home, which in today's time is essential, while at the same time can completely strengthen the need to be at a certain location at a certain time. And that these are some great tools for retailers to use. The latter meaning that you can turn your physical brick and mortar into an experiential destination that causes folks to want to be there, you know, on Sunday at 10 a.m. because we're going to have a giant graffiti, you know, wall where you're, where, um, you know, maybe with, uh, you know, some moderation, people are able to contribute to and take pictures and, and go viral with. Uh, so there, there's a lot of upside on, on both of those uses of AR. Yeah, I think I think you're right, and I think uh, you know we're seeing that with malls. Malls are having to become more you know entertainment destinations, and these experiences are going to be living and breathing. Um, and then we're going to use sort of existing network protocols. So in the same way, you have you know domain over your physical space, you will have you know domain over you know who has permission to actually have uh, hang a digital experience in your space. Um, and there already are network protocols in place mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. um, so now that will just apply to, uh, you know, sort of a physical overlay. Um, yeah, but I, so, will, I will say oh. my absolute favorite AR brand experience was Burger King. Put a Burger King ad, I think it was in <laughs> McDonald's commercials, using AR. It was like brilliant <laughs> because there is no case law yet for that, right? So, <laughs> so until there is case law, I think, I, it's cool that people take advantage and play tricks like that. So <laughs> that's great. Um, so a question for Daniel uh, was just asking really uh, which segment you're seeing the most traction, um, who are really using AR with the best results. Um, 
we're really like honestly we're just seeing good results kind of across the board of if you were here at the beginning um seeing that little video um of the different sort of verticals like home goods electronics um just we're seeing pretty good adoption the the one area where a lot of people will ask about um is of course fashion uh, they, they they don't want to see a sweater folded up in front of them in their space they want to see that sweater on them uh, which makes sense i would too um <laughs> and we don't have support for that yet so that's sort of like the next phase is being able to support being able to try on glasses and hats and shoes and jewelry and watches and rings and all that sort of stuff because that makes up a good chunk of Shopify merchants and we just don't have um, good AR support for that yet. So um, I, I think, th well, that is one of the, sort of the big areas that we're going to be focusing on next. Okay. So if we're, if we're in like, let's say a, a sort of 1.5 now in terms of you know, the evolution of bringing kind of AR into the fold. We've talked about some of these larger ideas and constructs around really bringing um, entertainment into the fold and music and these more kind of experiential, um, you know, kind of AR use cases. Can we talk about maybe what the evolution will be? What do you think we'll see over the next two and three years? We're going to have wearables, you know, real wearables uh, in the next two or three years. Um, so what do you see that evolution and, and sort of this blending of entertainment and e-commerce and destination? I, I can jump in. I, I would say like, um, uh, I think this is a really interesting question. Uh, from, from my perspective, I do believe that uh, interactive, meaningful, augmented reality leveraging a smartphone is, is here today, uh, whether that be to, to view a 3D model up close, um, as, as Daniel and Ashley were talking about, where uh, like really the, the product looks real right in front of you, all the way through to playing a multiplayer interactive game on the web. Um, uh, so I think over the next you know, two to three years, we continue to, uh, to see the adoption grow on smartphone augmented reality, uh, because we're just really at the beginning uh, of, of seeing all the, all the entirety of the masses start to you know, leverage this as a new uh, tool for them to be able to make some purchasing decisions or engage with artists or you know, get messages from presidents, whatever it might be. Um, and, and that's also because like the brands and organizations are just starting to put a lot of budget towards the use of augmented reality. So I see the next two to three years as continuing to build upon this amazing foundation that we're all talking about today. And those next two to three years are mainly smartphone driven. And I think that's an, that's an excellent device to leverage seeing that, um, you know, uh, the nearly um, most of the population around the world have a device that they've been carrying around for 10 years and they're looking for new things to do uh, with, with that same device in their hand. Um, when it comes to wearables, uh, personally, I'm, I'm extremely excited, of course. I've been ex excited about wearables for, you know, the, since, since uh, 2012 when, when I <laughs> dedicated my life to the space. But um, I, I, I believe that we'll see some interesting wearables hit the market. But um, I don't know if it's a two to three year uh, span for the end consumer. It may be for what Ashley and Daniel were talking about for the use in the enterprise. So we, we, we may be seeing some of the retailers use it for inventory purposes or design purposes, um, I could get on board with, uh, with that timeline, perhaps for those use cases. Yeah, I like that. I like that timeline, Tom, though. That's the one we want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, yeah, I keep I, saying it'll happen. Go ahead, Ashley. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. And I'm so excited uh, for like the leaked Apple wearable, which I think will, will kind of drastically change things. Um, cause they're so much better at like, design and, and, you know, than the poor Google Glass that was too early. And did not go well, um, but the web is here today. And so just, again, just having that 3D version on your website today is helpful. And that's getting brands to, to figure out their 3D strategy. And I even see, you know, product placement with 3D assets. You can then start to do product placement that's programmatic within videos and media, um, which, which becomes very interesting. So if I'm watching a TV show, I'm seeing someone wearing Adidas and you're seeing someone wear Nikes becomes very interesting. Um, and, and I see that happening over you know, the next two to four years as brands start to have these 3D assets, you can do so many interesting things with, um, not just you know, waiting for an AR headset to be with people. 
And do you feel that that, because I love that, I, love, I think that's a great point. Do you feel that, that brands are going to start to have more kind of one-to-one -one relationship with their consumer instead of sort of through ad agencies and marketing agencies? And forgive me if you're from an ad agency or marketing agency here, but it seems that we are really moving in that direction where brands are, are building their own experiences to have that kind of direct uh, engagement with their consumers. They are, um, but I'm even, you know, I had a conversation this morning with a media company. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, they're used to selling commercials. They know people hate commercials. We skip them. We record. We're, we, they're trying to figure out what is that next commercial. And it's, it's also coming from the media companies saying, how do we start selling advertising in a way that's more fun and exciting and actually working? Because I don't watch commercials, but. Yeah, I, I would agree with Ashley. I mean, I think we've always traditionally seen with emerging technologies that from a, from an end consumer perspective, the, the first industry to really be the pioneers to start moving the needle are in advertising and marketing and entertainment, right? And so, um, you know, on, from an eight ball perspective, we're definitely seeing our platform being used directly by organizations, but as well by a tremendous amount of agencies that are really helping to come up with some creative and meaningful um, ROI centric, you know, campaigns and experiences for their brands and in turn helping to educate not just um, the brand itself and, and their organization on the value of augmented reality and what to do with it, but also the end users, is what, which is what we need. Um, uh, one thing I will add on, Amy, your point about like where, where are we going in the next two to three years, I think one thing that might be interesting, again, still facilitated by desktop and, and smartphone um, devices is um, watching how augmented reality itself becomes its own retail sector. Um, in that uh, right now we're talking a lot about product visualization and virtual try on, but as you know, snap camera in particular, uh, uh, really shone a light on uh, with their partnership with L'Oreal recently on being able to wear virtual makeup on, you know, Google meet calls. Um, I definitely see how we're uh, entering a time where the purchase of virtual goods, which is nothing new to, you know, gamers, um, starts to become democratized in every day to, um, you know, the consumers at large, especially as we have uh, really entered the, the virtual stage of our uh, existence. Um, uh, you know, obviously exasperated by a lot of catalysts. Uh, so that I think is something to watch and that's kind of exciting all on its own. So if you're a retailer, you know, I, I've, been, I've been saying this, it's like if you're not in augmented reality or virtual reality, you're only making money in one reality. Why would you only make money in one reality? <laughs> <laughs> so. I love that, I love that. Um, and Daniel, so we have a question about uh, AB testing 3D assets, which I think is interesting just in this general uh, notion of like, how, are, how do we manage these assets as we get you know, more and more and more of them? Um, but I think that's a really interesting point. Do you have uh, some of your retailers who are A/B testing um, different 3D assets, and you know what are what what would what would the differences look like? So, so wait, uh, just to be clear, is the question like A/B testing one version of a 3D asset versus another, or having 3D versus it, not having 3D? No, it looks like it's A/B test 3D assets, uh, and it's in the second half of the question is what are the best ways, uh, what are the best analytics tools for AR? So my guess is it's around, you know, are people doing more than one 3D asset, maybe with different shaders, or are we getting mm -hmm. that granular? So they just do, they do one, and that's they're seeing such a spike that that's enough. Um, it's still so early on our platform with adoption of 3D, like we haven't seen anyone take it to that, that next level to say like, well, what if I test it out? Like, do, it's, it's something that we do want to figure out, like, what is the level of quality that consumers expect? Um, and by quality, I just mean like quality of the textures, accuracy in terms of the geometry. Like if you were to see a sofa in AR, um, maybe you only care about how big is it like you don't need to go up and say like oh like what, what does this stitching look like i want to inspect that stitching really up close and if you don't care about that stitching well then maybe the 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 merchant doesn't need to pay that extra money to make sure that that level of detail is captured so that is something that we want to kind of 
help figure out and try to do it on a um, platform wide scale. So we don't have to tell all of our merchants, hey, why don't you all just go off individually and pay a bunch of money to get like 10 different versions of every product done and do all the A-B testing. We want to try to be as opinionated as possible as we give sort of our best advice of level of quality, file size um, of these assets to our merchants. Yeah, I think what the sofa looks like with, uh, you know, a red wine stain or <laughs> so someone dropping a tomato sauce or something on it would be good. Um, but, but in terms of managing these assets, and it's, you know, I'm seemingly obsessed with this <laughs> because it is a challenge once you really start to, to have multiple 3D assets. And I've worked with companies that they don't even know that they have these 3D assets in, in another, you know, division of the company. So they're, they're recreating them. Um, are you seeing some ways now and some tools to like essentially like a Lightroom for 3D assets, right? Where you can actually store them, you can tag them, and you can do kind of you know minimal adjustments. Is that coming? How, and if so, how close are we? We do that. So. Okay, so this is <laughs> this is it. Uh, yeah, I mean our our it's a cloud-based content management system with locations, tags, attributes. So you can add any type of feature you want to track and. At least with our web viewer, we do add the ability to change HDRI maps and exposure. Um, so you can adjust lighting, uh, similar to how you would adjust a photo. Um, you know, it's it's not uh, today. We don't have the ability to change shaders and things like that, but it's something we're looking at. But. Yeah. Great. Ta-da. See? And I, I promise that was not like a canned softball question. I was, yeah, so, I'm last minute ahead, so, uh, <laughs> so I didn't know. I didn't even know that Ashley was going to be here. <laughs> um, all right. So let's look at some other, uh, I think we've got some good questions here. Uh, A-B testing. Uh, incorporate in today, uh, let's see, especially game engines. All right, so based on the technology that you incorporate today, especially game engines like Unity and Unreal, and with Tony Parisi here, are, are we only going to talk about Unity? I'm just kidding. Um, do any, any of you believe that AR has a potential for virtual production? And actually, I did talk about that this morning on an earlier, um, on an earlier panel. So um, anything on, again, going back to that entertainment piece um, and being able to just play sets, for example, are you seeing that, Ashley? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions too for real estate wanting to like stage homes with virtual furniture, which I would imagine, you know, is very, is very similar um, to virtual props. Um, I think virtual, someone should start a virtual prop company um, because it, it's all moving that way, especially, you know, talking with some friends last night who did, uh, they did motion capture with a team in Canada and one in LA and they were able to do all that virtually. It was amazing that that worked. And I was like, well, are you going to do that in the future? And like, probably it saved us a lot of money, you know? So uh, it, it is coming and we are seeing, you know, even the Lion King, how that was made. So it's, it's already started. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And Danielle, are you seeing any, any of those types of, I mean, I guess Shopify is a very different platform. So that's the interesting thing with Shopify, right? Empowering over a million merchants, you know, we have big multinational brands, small mom and pop shops and everything in between. So there's experimentation happening kind of at all levels. I haven't seen any examples yet of them using sort of virtual sets, um, but it is something that I'm really passionate about. And like our team's job is to make the argument for 3D. And we have a pretty strong case right now, but it's to keep building on top of that to the point where it's just like, it'd be ludicrous not to invest in 3D. And one of the areas that we do see being really powerful, like I mentioned before, is the, the CGI photography, being able to generate photos of, you know, infinite amount of variance and colors and whatnot in these sort of virtual photo studios. But how could you leverage the kind of stuff that um, is being leveraged today with virtual sets of, imagine if you could just take a photographer who's really good at using like their Canon DSLR, but they could like, go into like when they look through the viewfinder they're looking into a virtual scene mm -hmm. and they can like swap out products and swap out configurations and you know take 10,000 photos in one day where normally they'd only be able to take a few because there's so much time and sort of moving sets around and all that mm -hmm. so that's really exciting but it's not happening right now with our merchants. I like the idea of, of the Seinfeld set though or, or being able to <laughs> replicate a set that you've seen 
mm-hmm. you know, and say, oh my God, I, lo- I want that lamp. I want the, the sofa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there, I, it, we can start to draw a line there. Go ahead, Tom. I think you had a comment. Well, what I was going to say, I, I love that. I love the points that are being made. By the way, like 3D asset creation and 3D asset pipeline is a critical part of the AR, you know, and VR and 3D ecosystem that we we need to put as much love and attention to because it's going to help unlock everything but i see i see this all coming together in the influencer economy as well by equipping eventually influencers with 3d objects that they can put into their scenes while snapping photos and taking video um, without having to have the physical product right and so it's kind of like a democratizing product placement like when you saw the coke can and friends episodes on a regular basis um, and so I, I think like i think there's some interesting um you know, more organic advertising and marketing opportunities for retailers once you're able to as, as daniel indicated once you have a 3d object what can you do with a 3d object i think that's such an important thing how much value can you get from that investment in the 3d object should be the question that you're asking in the same way you'd be asking yourself okay i, I just invested x amount of this video where can i put this video like on tv can i use it in a, in a, in a keynote can you know can i send it via an email blast um, and so I think, think there's a lot of opportunities on the reuse of that. And that includes, you know, uh, once we, we get to that point, this the kind of the user generated, you know, augmented reality content. Um, you know, Aqual, we just debuted in browser on device video recording, which is really going to change, you know, the experience for web AR. Uh, so the, this ability to place the 3D, uh, 3D art or, you know, AR experiences in your place and then and then use uh, the camera to, to record your experiences is definitely um, you know, one of the killer apps of augmented reality, I believe. So I'm excited to see that all come to fruition. Yeah, we have a great question from Roy Rodenhauser, um, which I think we talked about a little bit on, on our last panel, is do you see AR potentially affect the product life cycle by reversing it, starting from advertising a virtual version mm-hmm. to move it into physical production based <laughs> on demand, and the, the answer is yes. But yes. <laughs> please, ex- please, please ex- ex- expand, Tom. Oh, I think uh, oh, Daniel would be really great to to hear what he thinks here as well, uh, as well as Ashley. But I, I guess I will just quickly say, like, I I could see. Uh, you know, digital goods just being sold as just digital goods and have like a limited edition, you know, maybe like uh, only five of those available. Cause, for example, an, an artist is, is using the Cute app uh, currently to, to sell, you know, AR art for $10,000, of which there's only like a limited amount of that art available. Um, uh, and, and of course, he's going to use um, that as an input um, as to like what's selling and not selling to then uh, make the decision t- as to whether or not he's going to make a sculpture or, or make a piece of art. So I love this question. And I think, again, like we're just peeling back the onion layers on the many ways that retailers can add value um, outside of just like uh, engaging their end user with uh, with a are. Yeah, I think this is a whole new like version of artist proofs. <laughs> yeah, and from the the retail perspective, the retailers we're speaking to, especially in Europe, I mean, they, they are judged now on carbon credits, and they have to buy and, and replace carbon credits, and they see this as a huge potential to help reduce prototyping, reduce waste. You know, if if they could pre-sell and then drop ship and, and manufacture on demand, you're not going to have all that wasted. You think of how much fabric goes and sits at TJ Maxx and then it, you know, that's mm-hmm. at a discount and then it go, ends up in a landfill. Um, so I think there, there's huge potential, not just cost savings, but even, you know, environmental factors. And, okay. and it, it's about getting feedback or like as early as possible and as quickly as possible. Like imagine you're doing a Kickstarter campaign for some product, but now you could actually just say like, Hey, place this thing that doesn't even exist yet, place it in your home and like give us feedback. So not only are people then, you know, looking at it as though it were real in front of them, but they're saying, oh, you know what? Like, it's kind of clunky how this part is here. It doesn't really fit well in my space. And then if enough people say that, then you might say, oh, back to the drawing board, we have to change a few things. So that ability to almost magically teleport a product that doesn't exist yet into people's hands, that's something that retailers have not been able to do ever. And now it's possible with AR. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's it is tr- that's a that's a truly amazing concept. And then and then also really starts to to build that relationship between the brand and the customer because now they actually have an impact on what's being created. And so I think that that that's a wide open playing field. 
Um, so let's go kind of go back into the analytics and, and sort of a little bit where we started uh, around some of the behaviors and metrics. So besides the things um, that, that we've mentioned already, conversion rates and dwell time, what are some of the other metrics that retailers are measuring and, you know, in, in this space and, and finding, you know, successful numbers with? One thing that we want to get more data on, but like I said, it's still just kind of too early in the adoption of 3D by our merchants is uh, the effect on return rates. So if you have more confidence in what it is you're about to buy, uh, that should translate to you being less likely to return it because mm -hmm. you won't have that situation where you, you receive it and say, oh, crap, this doesn't fit in my space because you already would have tested that out using augmented reality. So as we start getting a little bit more data there, we're going to be wanting to share that out with, with a few reports. We don't have all the information yet, but we are seeing some positive signs that it is uh, reducing return rates. Yeah, I, I like that. I think there is a massive opportunity in reducing return by better acquainting yourself with the product or seeing that product on yourself or in the environment. But also product assistant plays a big role in this as well. And augmented reality does uh, a great job of this, uh, taking you know, what the 2D pamphlet or the 2D manual uh, is trying to convey and bringing it into like a 3D manner. So anything you need to put together, anything you need to set up like a router or you know, furniture, um, uh, toys, uh, the use of AR to help you be successful at that also plays in uh, a huge role in whether or not you're going to keep that product. Uh, so I, I think that there's something to, to take a look at there as well. So we have just about uh, four minutes left. So can we just sort of run down our line? We'll start with you, Tom, on just, uh, you know, project us into your perfect e-commerce retail future. And because you are the man from the future after all. <laughs> just give us, yeah, just give us, you know, some advice or just some, some parting words and then we'll go down the line. Sure. So I think uh, I think the big thing from the man from the future is going to maybe be a surprise. It's that uh, let's focus on today <laughs> and let's uh, and what we can do today, as you know, as Ashley and Daniel and I've been talking about is is a lot. And especially the opportunity on the Web is massive. And so uh, leveraging the Web as a platform for augmented reality and virtual reality needs to be on your strategy as a retailer, thinking about how to use augmented reality to make your online be more physical and to make your physical locations be more experiential are, is essential. Um, and and uh, as we're pointing out, uh, think beyond just how you can use augmented reality as a touch point for your consumer, but how you can leverage augmented reality as a tool as a retailer and how you do your business um, along the entirety of, of that process uh, from you know, product design all the way through to you know, inventory management. And Daniel. And just a quick add on to that, like it is so easy to do AR on the web, like eighth wall tooling is really awesome. But then also um, iOS and Android out of the box, if you just put a link to a 3D model on a website, it will load into a native AR viewer. That's what Shopify uses. It's nothing custom, it's just operating system level stuff that will pop up that 3D model and let uh, you see it in your space. As for kind of the vision of the future that I have, um, Imagine you go to a website today to buy a product and there's no product photography. There's nothing, there's some text. You'd say, wow, this sucks. Like this is a terrible brand. How could they not have product photos? That experience, that same thing is what's gonna happen, you know, five, 10 years out. They come to your site, you know, I'm a 3D model. I'm wearing my, my magical AR glasses and I can't view that thing in my space right now. This is bullshit, I'm going to somewhere else. That's what's gonna happen. You can avoid that. You can avoid being in that situation. That's kind of like, yeah, you can avoid all of that if you get started with 3D today. So do it. That is true. And you do have to start today because, you know, especially those companies that have, you know, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of, of products. Ashley, final thoughts. Uh, no, I, I completely agree with that, Daniel. And I think today every brand should be figuring out their 3D strategy. This is like the 80s when we went from film to digital. We are now moving from digital to CGI. Um, mm -hmm. Just like Ikea's kitchen catalog, is, as Daniel mentioned, the entire thing, not a photo was taken. Um, so really look at your business and, and connect the silos. So many times, like we worked with Lexus, they're like, we don't have a 3D model. Like you do, you manufacture the car, you know, like just connecting those dots between the silos of your company and having that one 3D asset from design to sales to advertising um, can save so much time and money.
Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank the three of you for all your amazing insights. I think we could keep talking for about an hour, but sadly we are done. I want to thank Dan Berger and Alex Chuang from Shape Immersive and of course Accenture and Rara Vancouver. And I am going to hand it back over to James to take us out. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks, Amy, and thanks to the whole group. Um, you know, unbelievable conversation, my head spinning. We do this all day long, but I learned a ton from all of you. So thank you for joining us today. Um, this is wrapping up the third installation of our series, Shape the Future. The fourth episode will be coming to you on July 16th, where we focus on how to restructure the retail organization around 3D assets. And so how are we able to create centers of excellence? How do we connect different business units, making sure that everyone's got visibility into what assets actually exist and how we can start to improve our processes in marketing, in supply chain, and in e-commerce. Um, I want to thank our sponsors again today, Accenture Interactive, Shape Immersive, and the Vancouver VR AR Association. There will be a recording for this webinar made available uh, in the next week or so, and so you know, we're happy to share that out with you. Um, if you have any questions for our panel today, please use the hashtag Shape the Future and Retail AR, and we'll try to collect those out and make sure that those are answered along stream, because what we are doing with Shape the Future is building a community here, right? We, we're seeing unbelievable conversion rates. We're seeing unbelievable process efficiencies. But at the end of the day, we've all got to connect with each other and we've all got to teach each other and, and make sure that we're stimulating these ideas. One thing I want to leave you with is, is a challenge. So I want you, whether it's your retail org or one of your customers, I want you to go down that funnel. So take a 3D asset, build it into an ad unit and into an experience and then start to place that into a product page or somewhere in your e-commerce environment. And you can start to see the efficiencies that come with having a 3D asset, but you'll start to connect the dots. And so that's my challenge to you is, is, is really start playing with that internally. It's quick, it's cheap, it's easy, and it's, it's far more interesting than, than 2D flat static images. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye.